Portland was quiet last night after a long weekend of protests. Saturday's planned rallies were smaller and more peaceful than expected, but Saturday night protests downtown turned violent. Officers declared an unlawful assembly. As Christine Pitawanich tells us, some say police were too aggressive with the public and journalists. This is Saturday night near the Justice Center in downtown Portland. It looks like another night of protests in Portland, but those documenting the night on social media say it was different. Some are accusing the police of being too aggressive. This video shows a man first displaying a sign at police that's shoved out of the way. Then he shows his middle finger to a police officer. That's when he gets a face full of what appears to be pepper spray. Journalists and press photographers were also seen in social media videos getting pushed around. That led to Oregon Governor Kate Brown tweeting about it. She said, quote, free speech and free press are two of my core values. I take the use of physical force by law enforcement officers seriously, whether it involves members of the public or the media. Brown is asking law enforcement to look into it. Portland police say demonstrators were throwing objects at them, like full beverage cans, firecrackers, and rocks. Police say they repeatedly warned people to get out of the street, but they didn't listen. Meantime, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office says it arrested 30 people throughout Saturday's demonstrations, including this guy who tried to make a run for it. He ran for two blocks before police caught up with him. The people arrested range in age from 17 to 48, and the majority appear to be from Oregon. The group of Portland police officers who were deputized on Saturday morning still have that designation, but it's unclear how long it'll last. Being deputized means that anyone who attacks them could face federal charges, basically a stiffer penalty. And the governor's executive order is now lifted. It allowed law enforcement from different agencies to work with one another to prevent possible violence associated with a planned far right wing Proud Boys rally on Saturday. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. The ACLU of Oregon is calling on Governor Kate Brown to appoint a special independent prosecutor to investigate alleged police abuses involving protesters and journalists over the last several months. So in a statement, Interim Legal Director Kelly Simon said, quote, we have had to file multiple lawsuits over the last several years to hold law enforcement accountable in Portland and currently have six active cases against local and federal police for violating the rights of Oregonians at protests. Simon also said our government leaders must take action. Let's get to our wildfire coverage this morning. On one hand, we can't ignore the fact that about a million acres of land has burned in Oregon. But on a more positive note this morning, firefighters continue to make progress over the weekend with the state's largest fire. So here's the update this morning, starting with the Beachy Creek Fire in Marion County. It's now 56% contained. The Lion's Head Fire is 34% contained. In Clackamas County, the Riverside Fire also at 34% containment and the Holiday Farm Fire, that one's east of Eugene, it stands at 50% containment. The Oregon Office of Emergency Management says nearly 2,300 homes have been destroyed. We know at least nine people have died in the fires and five others are still missing. Also, for anyone who's going through the process of applying for federal help right now, FEMA is staffing a resource center in Clackamas County to help wildfire victims with those applications. So the center will be set up all this week at the Malala River School District Community Gym. We know the Beachy Creek Fire did a lot of damage to the small city of Detroit. Now deputies are escorting people into their town to assess what's left. Tim Gordon rode into Detroit with one of those caravans to give us a first-hand look. We lined up Sunday morning in Gates, along with dozens of other vehicles, then through the roadblock, escorted by sheriff's deputies heading east. All along the way, we could see the trees burned up on both sides of Highway 22. And then we arrived in Detroit, a city that today is not what it used to be. Some of the landmarks are just gone. Before, Cedar's Restaurant greeted you on the west side of town. Now its iconic sign is the only thing rising over the rubble. City Hall is leveled by fire. So is the fire station. Only a burned out fire engine is left, parked on the street. And one street over. Today is the first time we got a chance to come out here. And it's very, um, what an amazing sight, I think. Just the drive up here and it's 
a pretty sad situation right now for everyone, I think. Alma Barajas and her husband are looking over what's left of their second home, a place the Salem couple visited a lot before more recently making it a rental. They have fond memories of summers in Detroit. Everybody just comes out here and has a wonderful time. Right now, the quietness and you, there's the atmosphere of, of silence here right now. I think everybody's just trying to, you know, get back into, you know, the swing of things. But if you see the wheel there. Dan and Christy McMorlin are back to assess their truck and camper. There's nothing to save. The couple was returning to Salem from Central Oregon when they hit a rock on the road as the fire raged east of Idana. They made it to Detroit after changing a tire. Changing a tire in a firestorm, everything after that was a piece of cake. Except it, for the smoke and you couldn't see. It, breathe, it really, it really was a piece of cake after that because this was, the, it was, this was bad. It was there. Their son had modified the Ford Ranger to make it really special. It is very hard to. It's very hard, and I know it's, it's just stuff and it can be replaced, but it's, it's a sentimental value. We also spoke to the mayor of Detroit, and he says, well, it's awful to see all the damage and destruction. He also points out that there is plenty of life still here. You can see it in the green trees around. He says that's a sure sign there'll be a comeback in Detroit. And so that gives us hope. Um, and we've come from uh, devastation to we're going to rebuild it. Uh, tremendous support from, from volunteers calling, emailing, saying, let us know what you need and when you need it. We have our moments where it's just hit you over the head and, and you cry a little bit, but uh, then you start thinking about the things that, that are positive here. In Detroit, Tim Gordon, KGW News. And a reminder this morning that you can help the wildfire relief effort by giving to our Northwest Response Fund. Go to kgw.com forward slash Red Cross to donate. And thank you so much to everybody who's already joined the effort. Over the past couple of weeks, your generosity has helped raise more than $1.8 million for people here in Oregon and in Washington. Portland business owners are adapting once again for when their outdoor seating permits expire November 1st. It was one way some restaurants stayed in business throughout the pandemic. Well, the recent rain last week, it's a reminder, sitting outside in the fall for a meal brings some challenges, right? It's a little cold. Some are already considering winterizing those outdoor seating areas if the city extends the permits. Others are putting up tents, but as you can imagine, that is just another added expense. You know, no one's going to want to sit out in the rain, and we're just trying to figure out anything we can do to basically limp through this and get to the other side. A PBOT spokesperson says the city is exploring whether to extend those permits beyond November 1st. They haven't made a decision yet, but they're asking the public to take a survey on the parking plazas. I did it this weekend. It's really easy. We have more information on how to do it on KGW.com.